Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're taking a concept that's, well, everywhere electricity, and we're going to zoom in on one specific part, electrical resistance. Yeah, it, it sounds technical, maybe, but it's really fundamental. Exactly. Our mission here is to pull out the key ideas, connect it to things you already understand, and uh, hopefully make it clear without getting lost in jargon. Right. So the big question for you listening is, what actually is electrical resistance and why should you care? Why does it matter for understanding how, well, everything electric works? And the sources we're drawing on today, they use some fantastic analogies. Really helpful for getting it. We'll start with just the everyday idea of resistance and build up. Okay. Because honestly, once you get a feel for resistance, you start to see how all sorts of electrical things function. It's, uh, it's pretty foundational. Okay, let's do that. Let's start with the everyday meaning. We all kind of know what resistance means, don't we? Yeah. Like pushing against something that doesn't want to move or, you know, hitting resistance when you're trying to get a project done. Yeah, that feeling of being hindered. Right. The sources define it as refusing to yield to or endure against a force or condition. So even when people talk about like high resistance power against germs. Right, like immunity. Yeah, it's that same idea of an opposing force, something stopping or slowing things down. And what's really neat is how perfectly that idea maps onto electricity. How so? Well, in electrical terms, resistance is basically how much the flow of electric current gets hindered or blocked. Okay. So if you have high resistance in an electrical circuit, it means the electricity, the electrons, they're having a tough time moving through. The current just can't flow easily. So that's electrical resistance. That's the term, yes. And we measure it in a unit called the ohm. You write it with the uh, Greek letter omega. Ohms. Okay, so like if something has 100 ohms? It means it's hindering the electricity 10 times more than something with, say, 10 ohms. It's yeah. a measure of that opposition. Gotcha. And when engineers just say resistance, they usually mean this electrical kind. Pretty much always, yeah. In context, it's understood we mean electrical resistance. Okay, the analogies you mentioned sound helpful. The sources use a road analogy. They do, and it's a good one. Think about a road engineer. What do they want? Smooth traffic flow, I guess. Exactly. So how do they achieve that? They build roads that are wide, right? Mm -hmm. And ideally short. And they use smooth materials like asphalt, anything to make it easy for cars to move. Makes sense. So how does that connect to electricity? Well, just like cars need good roads, electricity needs a good path to flow well. Low resistance is like a wide, smooth, short highway for electrons. Ah, okay. So resistance in this analogy is anything that messes up that smooth flow. Precisely. It's like the narrow lanes, the potholes, maybe a really long winding road that just slows everything down. It's the stuff that gets in the way. Okay, I can picture that. The sources also mention water pipes. That feels pretty intuitive, too. Yeah, that's another great one. Imagine a water pipe at your house, maybe a garden hose, and it gets kinked or stepped on in the middle. Right. The water barely trickles out. Exactly. Because there's huge resistance right there in the crushed part. The flow is obstructed. So for electricity. It's very similar. Oh. Think of the wire itself. Maybe there are impurities in the metal or just the way the atoms are arranged naturally. Yeah. They can act like obstacles for the electrons trying to flow through. Like little blockages in the pipe. Exactly. And those obstacles, those blockages, they increase the electrical resistance. They stop the current from flowing smoothly. So it really just boils down to this, the more stuff getting in the way of the electrons. The higher the electrical resistance. Yeah, I do. Okay, that really helps visualize it. So sticking with the road analogy for a second, we talked about width, length, and the material of the road affecting the flow, mm. does that directly translate to what determines the amount of electrical resistance? It absolutely does. This is where the analogies really nail the physics. Electrical resistance is lower, meaning electricity flows better when first the conductor, the wire, has a wide cross-sectional area. Like a multi-lane highway, more space for electrons. Perfect. <laughs> Second, when the length of the conductor is short, Less distance to travel means fewer chances to bump into things, basically. All right. Shorter trip. And third, it depends on the material itself, specifically something called its intrinsic resistance. Intrinsic resistance. Yeah, it's like a fundamental property of the material. Every material has its own unique value that says how much it naturally resists electrical flow. So some materials are just naturally better paths than others. Exactly. A material with a low intrinsic resistance just doesn't put up much fight against the moving charges. Electricity flows easily through it. And different materials, like copper versus rubber, have vastly different 
intrinsic resistance values. Okay, so with length and this intrinsic property of the material itself, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So knowing that, how do we actually use this? How are material like categorized based on this resistance and how does that show up in the technology we use? Ah, uh -huh, great question. This is where it gets really practical. We basically group materials into three main types based on how much they resist electricity. Okay, what are they? First up, we have conductors. These are the materials with very low electrical resistance. Electricity flows through them super easily. Like the copper wires we mentioned. Exactly. Copper is a common one. The sources list a few in order, actually. Silver has the lowest resistance. It's the best conductor. Then comes copper, then gold, then aluminum. They all have low resistance. So these are what we use for wires and connections and things? Yep. They're the highways for electricity. Then second, you have the opposite, non-conductors which are also called insulators. Okay, so high resistance. Extremely high resistance. So high that it's really, really difficult for current to flow through them at all. Think of materials like glass or rubber. Right, you wouldn't make a wire out of rubber. Definitely not. But, and this is crucial, they are incredibly useful because they stop the current. They act as insulators. Uh, like the plastic coating on wires. Exactly that. That insulation, stops the electricity from going where you don't want it to go. It keeps it contained, keeps things safe. So insulators are vital, just in a different way. Okay, so conductors let it flow, insulators stop it. What's the third type? The third type is fascinating, semiconductors. These are materials that are sort of in between. Neither a great conductor nor a great insulator. Kind of. The resistance properties are somewhere in the middle. The key examples are materials like germanium G on the periodic table and silicon. Psi. Silicon, like Silicon Valley? Precisely. That's no coincidence. The amazing thing about semiconductors is that we can actually control their resistance very precisely. We can tweak them to act more like a conductor or more like an insulator under specific conditions. How does that help? Well, that ability to control the flow is the absolute foundation of modern electronics. Mm -hmm. All the incredible advancements in computing, smartphones, everything's built on semiconductor engineering. They are the core components in transistors and microchips. Wow. So resistance isn't just about stopping electricity. It's also about controlling it in these really sophisticated ways. Exactly. It's not just an obstacle. It's a fundamental property we can manipulate to design circuits that do amazing things. It really is amazing. Just thinking about how we went from the simple idea of pushing back to understanding conductors, insulators, and these crucial semiconductors, it definitely gives you a new perspective. It does, doesn't it? Understanding how resistance works, how we measure it, and how different materials behave really unlocks a lot about the technology we rely on. You start seeing it everywhere. You do. From the heating element in your toaster, which uses resistance to generate heat, to the reasons why power lines need those big ceramic things. The insulators. Right, to stop the electricity from escaping. It all can be back to controlling electrical flow by managing resistance. So maybe a final thought for everyone listening. Next time you look at a power line, or even just the charging cable for your phone, think about those principles we talked about. Yeah, the need for good conductors, the vital role of insulators. Right, the wide paths, the short paths where possible, the careful choice of materials. It's all designed around managing this fundamental property, electrical resistance. You might just see your everyday gadgets uh, a little differently now 